understanding about life. Solomon would give first his credentials that he indeed was in a position to speak concerning life. And he had certain understanding that he wants to impart to us. And he would tell us the character of life under the sun. That's from verse 13 to 15. And then he tells us the consequences of living such a life. By experience, he tells us that I've lived it. And he tells us that it's not worth it right? in terms of the character of this life under the sun, he tells us five things. It's a sore travail, it's vanity, it's vexation of spirit, it's crooked, it's wanting. Verse 13, verse 14a, verse 14b, verse 15a, and verse 15b. And then he tells us the consequence of living this life under the sun. Vexation of spirit, verse 17, and grief and sorrow, verses 18a and 18b. This book of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon in the evening years of his life as a personal testimony to all posterity to teach the futility of worldly ambitions and desires in life that is apart from God. He wants to send a clear message to us have no doubt in your heart that the only way to find true satisfaction and meaning in life is through a relationship with the living God. If you have Jesus, you have everything. Without Jesus, you have nothing. This is the final equation of life that He wants to impart to us. And he wants us to learn it well and know who Jesus is. And he makes this conclusion at the end of his life. He says, I'm hurt and I'm sharing with you my journey of grief, seeking the things of this world. You have to go through it in order to know its pains, its griefs. And he's telling us, I've gone through it. You don't want to go there. And so it is uh, an exciting journey to travel with him through his experiences under the sun, not having to you know, feel the pain right, ourselves, but to feel it right, as we put ourselves in his shoes, as he shares his testimony concerning how futile it is following this world's wisdom. And so he tells us that he has tried it all. There is, it is not worth treading, uh, like what Jesus says, on the broad way to destruction, but walk that narrow way through that straight gate. So he wants us to learn right, uh, from his experience so that it serves as a warning to us if we are going the same way as him. And it is a good check for the people of God. I don't think we, will, we are not being dragged by the things of this world. He wants to wake us up. He wants us to see in perspective. He wants us to examine our own lives. If we are in any way pursuing things under the sun, he tells us that we will be disappointed by it. And so he <clears throat> writes this book right, uh, to simply tells, tell us that he had gathered some wisdom about life, some understanding of life, to talk about it. And that's the meaning of the word ecclesiastes. It means, the word means preacher, one who had gathered wisdom to speak about life. And so verse 12 is our introduction, giving to us the credentials of Solomon, why his message is worthy of our <coughs> attention. 
He tells us that God has given him the opportunity to experience it all. He was king in Jerusalem during the golden age of Israel. He had everything at his disposal, great resources to experiment and pursue this life under the sun all the way to the end. And what else did he have? He had God's word with him. And he had the promise from God that God would give him wisdom. And so he's able to see both sides of the coin. And that's why he's able to write to us to help us to see in perspective, to understand life truly. And as a king, he is tasked to copy the scriptures. Right? All of the scriptures, he is to write it out by hand and then he is to use it, study it for the rest of his life. And so the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 17 verses 18 to 20 that the king of Israel is to write a copy of this of the law, right, the Torah, in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of this law and the statutes to do them. You see, when we spend time on God and his word, we learn to live above the clouds not be dragged down by the things of this world and we can see in perspective how we ought to live this life and he tells us that when we study the word of God it humbles us it put us in perspective who we are help put us in our position put us in our place and that's what we need to be reminded of many a times right? and that we may not be lifted up and above our brethren and we may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left. And he says that to that end, it may prolong your days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. And so God had endowed him with this special wisdom. He had God's word with him to know what is the right thing to do. And yet, God gave him the, I would say, the opportunity to go the other way. And he described it as madness and folly. Right. And, you know, although he had the word of God with him, uh, he, he also uh, blundered in his life. Uh, when the queen of Sheba came uh, to Israel, she was able to see the special wisdom of Solomon. That's one side of it. Right? Uh, God truly blessed the nation of Israel. Right? The temple was being built at that time. 1 Kings 10, verse 6 to 9 tells us that she came to the king and it, she said, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came and my eyes had seen it, and behold, the half of it was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. But we also know that he inherited from his father, King David, a sin nature. As David wrote in his Psalms, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The way of the flesh, the fallenness that is in him, 
caused him to fall by the wayside through many years of his life. And he's writing it so that, you know, we don't waste time. God doesn't want us to waste our life away. Waste time right, in the things, indulging in the pleasures, in the things of this world. It is not profitable. And he wants us to see this in perspective. Solomon yielded, yielded to the last of the flesh, to the last of the eyes, to the pride of life. And he is describing to us right, the character of this life under the sun from verse 13 to 15. He would tell us by observation, by exploration. Right? He went through this and he saw it. Right? Verse 13 to 15. Right? He tells us <clears throat> to observe. And he says that I experimented life. Verse 13 says, I gave my heart to seek and search out wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. And he says this, saw trivial. That are done, this are, he says this saw trivial has God given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. He says, I applied my mind to seek and search out all that is done to be done under the sun. So with great curiosity, he observed, right? he, he, with great curiosity, right? he explored, and by virtue of his endowment as king, he was able to garner resources to make such exploration. And <clears throat> he tells us at the end of it, that this life that is done, these activities that is done apart from God, with no heavenly perspective, that is earthly, that is earth-bound, earth-centered, is just good for this present life. And he tells us, he wants us to think and think and think again. Have the wisdom to distinguish what is truly beneficial for you and what is not be very very sure that you flee from it he says he saw the sons of men struggling in this life living by their own wisdom and he calls this exercise sore trivial an evil business this is his, the first character of this world's wisdom an evil business <coughs> and he says <coughs> and the word men describes the fallen man the man that was created out of the dust of the ground the man who by disobedience partook of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and broke the happy union that he had with his creator God and so he's trying to tell us that the people who are living in this world do not know the living and true God. And that is why God raised the nation of Israel. Israel was to be that nation to jot the nations of the world to know the living and true God. And that is why in the heyday of Solomon when he was young, when the temple was being built, the glory of God was there and the queen of Sheba uh, this queen from Africa came and saw the glory of it. Uh, and she was without words to describe the glory of the wisdom of God blessing that nation. Uh, but we see how he soon departed. I remember, <clears throat> uh, besides writing a copy of the scriptures, you know, in Deuteronomy 17, he was also asked not to multiply horses, not to multiply gold, and not to multiply women. Right? These three things he did. And he paid a very, very heavy price for ignoring God's word. And we realize... You know, how sad and uh, it is right, for, um, 
for Solomon. And so he's writing in hindsight. And he's telling us that this pursuit is just chasing the wind. It's meaningless. It's, uh, it's not profitable for you. And he tells us that it will disappoint you. Okay. Verse 15 uh, or verse 14. It says, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So he says that he has seen all of it. You name it, he's seen it. Right? The adverb all means all. Right? He had tasted it. Right? He tells us that you live a life with, without God in, in the equation of life, you're going to regret it. It's going to be meaningless, empty. Right. Then he goes on and he says, vexation of spirit is going to cause your spirit to feel so <coughs> um, um, uh, the word vexed is the word that describes you know, the heart being truly disappointed, right? disappointed. You, 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 you know, you, you place hope in something and that hope, you know, is empty. And so, you know, finally, after much endeavor, you realize that, you know, you're, you're chasing something that is regretful, not worth doing. That's why you know, he's speaking in that way and he's warning us, right? just like Lot. You remember? Abraham's nephew, right? he decided to get gain and he went to Sodom. Right? At first he pitched his tent towards Sodom, then he dwelt in Sodom. And how, you know, his family is affected by that association with the things of this world. He wanted to get some gain. He was somebody at the gate of Sodom. Right? When we trifle, you know, and want to get gain with the things of this world, thinking that you know, it would bring us security, it would bring us uh, 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 power and strength, and we realize that we are going to get disappointed by them. And so he wants us to have perspective. Right? Then in verse 15 to 15, he tells us uh, <clears throat> the other characteristic. Right? It is that it is crooked. Right? And that which is crooked cannot be made straight. He says that this world's wisdom, right? there is, uh, the word there means a bending, right? a perverting. And he tells us that it cannot be made straight. He says, he used the word this crooked to describe. That which cannot be straightened. You can't find the right way walking on a crooked path. In other words. And so he says that that which is crooked cannot be made straight. No matter how you try, you struggle on that crooked road, you'll still remain crooked. And what else, he says, and that which is wanting. And that's the other word he described. That is lacking. <coughs> and he says that, you know, <coughs> this world's wisdom, this world's, <coughs> the things of this world, is so crooked and so lacking uh, that there are so many holes in its wisdom, you know, that you can't patch it no matter how you try. Right. Um, and he would tell us the many aspects of, of uh, the things of this world, the philosophies of this world. Right. He tells us the thinking of men. Somehow, you know, it's just going 
moving and yet not hitting the spot. It's sad. It's sad. The, the Chinese, you know, uh, they believe in the way. Right? Chinese use the word Tao. Right? And there is great description concerning what the Tao is. Right? But the Bible tells us that the Tao is Jesus Christ. You see. But the wisest man we know right, spent all his time searching for that Tao by his own wisdom, couldn't find it. He knows that it, it is the most excellent way. And yet, you know, he don't know, couldn't pinpoint right, until God would just pinpoint to us right, through Scripture. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh, and the Word dwelt among men. Ah. Oh. What wisdom, you see? And such wisdom we can only find in the Word of God. And He tells us that, you know, if you pursue the wisdom of this world, ah, you learn it with a pinch of salt. Learn it in perspective with God's Word. And He tells us that, you know, the imperfection cannot be numbered. And so there are so many defects, in other words. Do not know where to start fixing it, or can it ever be fixed? All right. Ah. So he has shown us the nature or the character of this world's wisdom from verses 13 to 15, which he observes. Right, by his exploration, his observation. And now he wants to tell us the consequence of it, the outcome of those who pursue it. Right? The consequences, verse 16 to 18, by experience. He says, I commune with my own heart, saying, Lo, I came to a to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than all they that ha had, have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had created experience of wisdom and knowledge. He says, I say to myself, I have made great and increased wisdom, surpassing all who were before me over Jerusalem. And my mind has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Indeed, his wisdom was so great, he wrote 3,000 proverbs. The Bible says 1,005 songs. And 513 of his Proverbs were recorded in the book of Proverbs. And he says, I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. The word there means stupidity. Right? I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. Now, we all know uh, the knowledge of folly helps us to discern wisdom, right? And he <coughs> wrote many chapters of the Proverbs, right? But the Bible says, the King Solomon loved many strange women. Did he not write Proverbs 2, Proverbs 5, Proverbs 7, and Proverbs 9, warning us of strange women? And we know that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. <laughs> and so when Solomon was old, <coughs> the Bible says that his wives turned his heart after other gods <coughs> and his heart was not perfect with <coughs> the Lord his God. And as the heart of David was his father, for Solomon went after the goddess of the Zidonians and after Milcom, the goddess of the Amorites. So, although he was endowed with such wisdom from God, and yet, you know, he could fall. How about us? Right? If Solomon, someone who had such great wisdom that God endowed him, who can fall 
then you know we would have fallen a thousand times more, right? All the more, you know, we are to work out our feet, our salvation with fear and trembling. All the more we must realize how weak we are, how indisposed we are to sin, how we are so capable of falling just like that. If a man like Solomon with such stature can fall, you know, we ought to be very fearful. Right? And he's telling us the consequences of it. Okay? He was using his own wisdom. He married the Pharaoh's daughter. You know, the world's thinking is that, ah, I marry Pharaoh's daughter. She's my hostage. And he will not dare to do anything untowards me or my people. He shifted his trust from God to his political alliances through such marriages. And that's how idolatry infiltrated and came into Israel. You see, it came through the king and it affected all the people. And the people suffered heavily. Right. They had to have pay heavy taxes in order to finance the buildings of these many palaces for his wives and concubines. And later, he would face the wrath of God. And that's why he wrote in verse 18 to say that, For in, such, in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increases knowledge increases sorrow. So this is his conclusion of this world's wisdom. It is grief and sorrow. I share with you my own testimony. Uh, I came to know the Lord uh, during a time in the university where I was confronted with true wisdom and saw the light of the gospel that Jesus Christ is the living and true God through the witness of a lecturer, my wife, and my roommates in the hall. It was there that I came to know God and I was brought to the church. I was an agnostic. I was very enthralled with this man called Bertrand Russell. He was the son of a pastor who turned apostate. And I said, unless you can show me evidence, I will sit on the fence. I have a rational mind. I'm able to reason. And I feel that, you know, at that age, you can reason out anything. You know? Ah. So I used the book that he wrote, Why I'm Not a Christian, right, to refute Christian friends until the Lord opened my spiritual eyes. Bertrand Russell, he analyzed that the only way out for mankind is to form a world government. And this guy is a thinker. And this is where the world is heading today, a world government. And today you are seeing you know, the formation of the, the IMF. And the IMF is issuing what? Issuing currency, ah, special drawing rights, first world currency, one organization. He was the foremost British philosopher of the 20th century. And so I use his words to debate with a Christian that the only way out for man's woes is to form a world government. Indeed, you see, this is what the world is moving towards. Right? If you follow the world's way, the world's thinking, this is the ultimate con conclusion. But we all know right, that human government in the last 7,000 years right, has failed. There are more wars, you know, the nations are reloading themselves more than ever. Right on the table 
You know, they are not talking sense, they are talking feasts. No joke. But that's not what God's will is, is, you see. When Christ comes, He will show us what it is to rule by the virtues of God. And, and so on hindsight, right, having the knowledge of the truth from God's word, I realized that I was an advocate for the kingdom of the Antichrist. Do you shudder at the thought, if the Lord had not opened my spiritual eyes, I would be another digit fighting for the kingdom of the Antichrist, thinking that this is the way out of man's woes. And they get the brightest people in order to be in this part of this group. Dear friends, as a Christian with God's truth, we realize that we are living very near to the Lord Jesus' return. He will not return as a lamb, but as a lion of the tribe of Judah to judge the world. May we be on His side so that when He comes, we will be prepared to meet Him as Saviour as not, and not as judge, as a faithful servant and not as a wayward child. In short, Solomon is telling us that such a godless life doesn't satisfy the human soul. And this is the warning that the greater Solomon, our Lord Jesus, who is fully God and yet fully man, but without the sin nature, had to convey to us. He said this in Mark 8, 36 to 37. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And so Jesus gave the example of this rich man who was not rich toward God, but he was rich in the material things of this world and God took his life. And he realized that, you know, that's the end of it. And a time of reckoning will come to each one of us. And, you know, we all have to realize that the day will come suddenly. God has taken our dear brother James home yesterday. And we have known him for six months. And that's the end of life. But in that last six months of his life, he came back to God. And we thank God that He has won. He has fought a good fight. Right? Fought cancer for the last six months. And the Lord has taken Him home by an infection yesterday afternoon. Very surprised. Wife was bringing porridge for him. So we received a call to say that he is taken home to be with the Lord. That's the end of a man's life. What is in a the, in the man's life? The Lord wants us to know and see in perspective. And I quote the words of our late principal, the Reverend uh, Timothy To, on this passage of scripture. He says, by way of application, all who are outside Christ, be they great politicians or simple folks, whatever they do comes to zero in the sight of God. Great men might have contributed to the good of their country, but if they reject the Saviour Jesus Christ in their lifetime, it would profit them nothing. And so Solomon tells us the vanity of worldly wisdom. A life apart from God is not worth living. How did he know? By his experience. He was uh, in a good position to give an authoritative answer, being king. And he experienced it himself. He sought and he searched. 
and he acquired great wisdom and knowledge. And why did he know? Because he was hurt. He was being hurt. Worldly wisdom, life without God, he says, is sore trivial. It's evil. Worldly wisdom is vanity and vexation of spirit. Meaningless, valueless. And its character, he tells us, is crooked, cannot be made straight, is also lacking, is false. And the consequence of those who pursue this life to this or life to this end brings sorrow and grief. May the Lord help us to understand God's perspective of life that Solomon wants to bring to us, that we may truly know the way to God and use our time profitably and wisely lived in the fear of God and in obedience to His commandments. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank Thee for Thy mercy. Thank Thee for gathering us once again for prayer meeting. Lord, may Thou bless our time of prayer. May Thou bless Thy words concerning life that we may see in perspective life according to Thy word that we may receive Thy praise and we receive <coughs> thy, thy approval Lord, may thou, thy presence fill thy people that they may be guided and led. This I ask with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.